here to talk about a new project between CSI, CSIRO and Van Nord for a marine engineering company. Um, and that's relating to coral restoration techniques at a scale uh, relevant to the Great Barrier Reef. So as soon as we start thinking about that kind of scale of restoration, um, working with marine engineering companies is a pretty good starting point because these guys think in the scale that, as a scientist, I don't normally think of. Um, so just a little bit about the team profiles. Um, well, at CSIRO, you know, the I stands for industrial research, so um, that's the kind of research that CSIRO has traditionally done. Um, and a lot of it goes towards management, so a lot of it's not in the literature because it's basically really applied and for managers. Um, and what we bring to this, this collaboration is we have biologists, ecologists and modelers um, involved in this work. Now, Van Nord, they're a marine engineering company. Um, and then in the last, say, five to six, seven years, they've been putting a lot of effort into research and development. And part of that research and development has actually been in coral restoration practices. So they developed this thing called uh, the Coral Guard, um, which is essentially an a aquaria facility, an uh, aquaculture facility, excuse me, um, in a shipping container. And that's been used out in Coral Bay and in, in Ningaloo, northwest WA. Um, and it's currently stationed in the Bahamas, I'm pretty sure, where it's been uh, in use for a couple of years. So these guys are doing that kind of work. Um, and through one of our collaborators from Van Nord, he's also associated with Delft University, and uh, many of you probably know about Delft more than I do, but they specialise in, in marine engineering and fluid dynamics. Um, so just a little bit of background, you know, most people in this room already know the kind of current restoration approaches that have been applied throughout the world. Um, Historically, um, starting in about the early 90s with Alistair Edwards and, and Rinkovic really um, kind of pioneering this stuff back then. Um, and then many people have done a lot of work in this field. So uh, starting off, uh, coral transplanting of, of whole colonies has been conducted. Um, and you know, there's an appropriate time and place to do these kind of things. So if you're going to lose a reef because of a dredge or a dredge plume, well maybe you want to get rid of those colonies out of that area and put them somewhere else. Um, another really classic technique is, is coral gardening, throws through, so through asexual fragmentation um, and then growing those up in different nurseries, ex situ, in situ, um, and also capturing coral spawn. So Peter Harrison gave a great talk about this yesterday, um, and that can be done in situ as well as ex situ. Um, historically, and you know, this is a challenge that we're all basically facing, is that A, production has been limited in these kind of scenarios. Um, and the area has also been limited. So um, a meta-analysis in 2016 showed that the, the median area of rehabilitation in coral reefs is 35 metres square. Um, and the cost is, is pretty high. Um, you know, looking at about 165,000 as the median price for one hectare of reef. So the challenge that we're all facing here is well, how can we scale up to two to three orders of magnitude <laughs> to present, to uh, produce ten to hundreds of thousands of corals to restore reefs. Um, so the way that we approached this within our within our group was a first to do some modelling, um, and that's to compare two approaches. That was harvesting wild coral spawn slits or transplanting coral colonies to a target reef, um, and then following this modelling exercise, we then thought, well, okay, of those two optimal approaches. How would we actually do that logistically? What's the feasibility? So just for anyone that doesn't know what a wild spawn slick looks like, they're really immense. Um, uh, Oliver and Willis in, in 87 kind of described the concentration of larvae in these slicks. It's around 230 per litre. Um, and that's embryo, so that's the day following spawning. So we've already had a bit of a dive already. And it's past the first fertilisation bottleneck. So our first scenario, this is just a, a very simple kind of uh, way of how we modelled it. There's a lot of parameterization. I'm not going to go into that in detail. We harvest the coral spawn slip. One of the big unknowns is, well, how much mortality is there when we pump it from the water into the hopper of the dredge. And this kind of hopper is 13,000 cubic metres. That's sort of a medium-sized dredge, so it's a pretty significant amount of water. Um, the larvae then go through development within that hopper until they're competent 
And then following that, we then release them onto the reef passively, um, and then they, they settle, and then we've tracked everything through time um, until they're four-year-old mature colonies. Now, the other approach is transplanting coral colonies. So again, they get removed from donor reefs, put into the hopper of the, of the vessel, which is 13, uh, sorry, 1,500 metres square. Um, and then they, they get transplanted on the reef, they spawn, um, and then we follow those particles in the water column and see how many of those stay on that reef and go through settlement and metamorphosis, etc. Et um, just a brief kind of introduction into the parameters. I've got the full table if anyone wants to go into detail, um, but some similarities and differences. So there's a bit of a difference in the biology, obviously with harvesting spawn slits. Um, embryo density, really important. Pumping mortality, really important. Important. We have some idea about embryo density from a single study, um, without averages around it as well. Um, and pumping mortality, we have no idea about that. Absolutely no idea. No one's done this. Um, and with the transplanting colonies, we actually have a lot of information thanks to you know a lot of research um, in the literature. Um, next is about costings. So they share very similar costings. Costings for the transplant method are higher because we need about three weeks vessel time um, plus mobilisation, demobilisation. Um, and we all compared to one week with the, the harvesting approach. Um, and infrastructure is also higher with the transplanting approach. Daily retention um, differs. So what I'm presenting today is just the upper daily retention modelled for the Great Barrier Reef. That comes from Black it Out, 1990. Um, and that's a, a daily retention ranging between 87 to 97%. Um, we've also done work on lower bounds, but I'm not presenting that for simplicity. Daily retention in the hopper is 100% because it's a closed system. Uh, this is a huge unknown, um, and that's something that's been brought up quite a lot, um, and that's failure risk. I mean, we just don't have any idea about risk in this kind of scenario. So we, we try to be really conservative. Um, with the harvesting approach, we've assumed one in four failure risk, so that's a total zero. Um, maybe we're being ambitious or maybe we're being conservative, um, but we assume things like weather conditions and being able to concentrate sleeves, etc., add to this kind of failure. Um, and, uh, whereas with transplants, maybe failure risk is only about one in 10, because you transplant all the colonies and Cots come through. Um, and then the demographic rates are, are assumed to be equal. Um, and th there's a lot of literature on this, so larval survival comes from Pollock, Joe Pollock's work um, last year. Settlement comes from some of Peter Harrison's for the lower ranges and Alistair Edwards for the top ranges. And post settlement survival um, comes from, again, from Peter Harrison's stuff and some of my other stuff. So, what have we got? I'm just going to go through a series of slides at particular life history stages now. Um, so in terms of abundance, um, we end up with about two to three billion embryos um, uh, in both scenarios. It's higher in the transplant scenario, as you can see, um, than the, har uh, the harvesting scenario. Um, but then just after five days, we end up, well, there's a bit of a switch there because we're losing larvae, they're flicking off our natal reef, um, some are you know, going offshore or some are going to other reefs. Um, and thereafter, there's a similar abundance between settlers uh, in both methods, and that just follows on to mature colonies in the end, with about 100,000 colonies using both approaches. Um, now, in, in our modelling of the cost, um, again, you can see it's pretty similar between both scenarios at the embryo stage, um, and then that slightly increases as we go to the larval phase. Um, but thereafter, they, they remain the same, we end up, you know, at a kind of estimated cost of about fifty dollars per colony uh, at sexual maturity. So, given our kind of modelling of, of abundances and cost, we, we we basically decided that the optimal approach is harvesting coral spawn sleeves because, you know, the impact you're not shifting any colonies, your labour cost is really a lot more reduced, um, and you know, it needs to be tried. I've been thinking about it since 1982 when mass Spawning was um, first uh, discovered. So, how would we do it? 
help insects successfully harvest spawn slips at industrial scale. This is where the guys with that are really, really come in. Um, but first, you know, we propose to do this in the Southern Great Barrier Reef because at this point in time, that's where the highest cover is, um, you know, throughout the reef. Um, and so we, we could use our ERIS modelling to kind of get an estimate of whereabouts slicks should form based on currents and where reefs are located and things like that. Um, and then we'd also have a helicopter to kind of validate where these slicks are because when you start moving larger vessels, you're not kind of zipping around in a, in a six metre south, south wind or anything. Um, and then how to collect it. I mean, this is, you know, we, we kind of went to the oil literature because oil is, is hydrophobic as our coral, um, coral, coral slits. So we could move something, a vessel, you know, close to it get the boom around it, contain it, and then drag it towards the mother mothership. Now, if you can see that photo on the bottom right, the head sits at about 10 centimetres below the surface, but it's mounted with floats um, to get it in the right spot and at the right, right height, because you don't want a lot of air going in there, depending on your pump design, which is what I'm going to go to next. So, before we, went to a, before we go to a, a full trial, we will try this in a, in a smaller ship, which will be something like a multi-cat or a barge, because we need to see you know, how feasible is this kind of thing. Um, and so one of the things that we'll test here are the pumps. As you can see, the pumping kind of rates, we're, we're thinking about you know, a thousand litres of water a minute. It's, it's kind of, I can't really get my head around it yet, but I guess if you're an engineer, you can. Um, and you know, fortunately, this is where Delta is really coming in, and we've got a master's student who, who's already investigating this problem. So initially, we proposed to use two different types of pumps. They don't use propellers, so we're not chopping up larvae. But of course, they have things like shear stress associated with them. But Flocko is already kind of looking into these different pumps, and they can test all of these things over there, not with coral gametes, but with some kind of mimic, which you know, it's going to give an indication of, hopefully, give an indication of. Uh, you know, to improve our predictions. Um, so that, that's great, he's working on this. And, um, and we're going to use uh, 5,000 litre tanks for this, this stage of this trial. Um, and so hopper dredgers use galvanised steel, so they will be one of our tank designs. But, we're, you know, maybe, maybe they're all going to die in galvanised steel. I don't think so, but we have to test this. Um, so we're also going to just try out trial plastic. <coughs> I mean, if anyone's raised larvae before, you've probably done it in an alley bin. Um, and you know that could be coated on a dredge if necessary in the hopper. Um, and then we're going to have this randomly um, located on the deck because we're scientists, so we'd have to have a little bit of experimental design here. Um, and so then we're going to rear these through five to seven days, test the viable through the rearing process, um, and you know probably start to check competency at like two days thereafter just to you know get an idea of competency curves. And we've heard that, you know, often it's been, uh, it's hard to get corals to settle on vessels. So we want to see whether this is going to affect what we're doing as well. Um, so how are we going to evaluate the effectiveness of such a trial? Um, well, A, the first thing is, to, well, can we concentrate coral sleeves? It's a really basic kind of question that we have to trial. Two, can we, if we can concentrate them, can we do that? at a higher concentration as has been recorded in the literature. Thirdly, well, what is the larval survival um, when we do this kind of uh, technique and which technique has higher survival? Fourthly, uh, which is the best tank type for larval survival and development? And fifthly, as I said already, can we rear those larvae to competency on the board, on the deck? So if all of this works, this is what we would imagine it kind of ends up looking like. We have spawning, we concentrate those slits with booms, we suck those up into a, into a hopper, um, estimate that 2 billion embryos for a medium-sized vessel, we rear those, we then have about 500 million competent larvae, and we can then disperse those onto a reef um, at you know, the optimal time. And you know, how does this look in the future and in, in terms of other um, things that other activities that people are doing? Well, firstly, you know, we, we assume that this would enhance the recovery, recovery of reefs with negligible impact, impacts in natural populations. 
something we need to also think about more seriously in the future. Um, but you know what's super cool is this is entire assemblages of corals here. And we all know that resilience and recovery of reefs is, is really tied to functional redundancy and natural diversity. It's been shown in many systems before coral reefs. Um, and you know, that kind of application is you could translocate larvae from healthy to damaged reefs, um, you know, uh, use heat to tolerant corals that are developed in other systems, maybe in sea sands, you know, we can heat harden translated coral, but uh, heat hardening of those larvae as they're being translocated. So if you shock larvae for a few days beforehand and then out plant them, maybe they have high survival rates with future bleaching. Physiologists know way more than me about that. And you know, maybe you can add heat tolerance by getting that the larvae may ingest at super high concentrations. So um, you know, from, from all of the team and myself, thank you very much. Um,